and now currently Vice Chancellor of JNTU in the city of Kakanada in the state, in the great state of Andhra Pradesh, South India. In addition to that, he has received the following honors. He is an elected fellow of the Royal Statistical Society, an honorary fellow of the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers, a fellow member of the International Society for Intelligent Biological Medicine, an elected fellow of the Indian Institute of Bridge Engineers, elected fellow of the Institution of Electronics and Telecommunications Engineers, a fellow of the Institution of Engineers, elected fellow of the Society for Design and Process Science, and least but not last, not, not least but last, Colonel of the Regiment of NCC Government of India, by no means least. His publications are really far too numerous to mention. They go on for uh, perhaps uh, 40 pages of his curriculum beat. Uh, I should also add on a personal note that <coughs> Vice Chancellor Apadagaru has been a great friend of Brigham Young University these last couple of years. We only started the BYU program in India in 2009, and in each of its three iterations, Vice Chancellor Apadagaru has invited the entire, uh, all the students participating in our program the 150 miles down from Vishakhapatnam to Kakanada to visit his campus. He has sent the cars, he has picked us up, he has accommodated us in the university guest house and provided us with a hospitality that really you just have to go to South India to understand how wonderful it truly is. He instituted a special day at his campus in that time of year called International Day and our students on the BYU program have, uh, with great joy, participated in that program uh, three times. I should also introduce, or make, at least make mention of the fact that Vice uh, Chancellor Aparagado's family is with him here today. His wife, his son, and his daughter. His, uh, his son is studying um, uh, a graduate course at SUNY Binghamton. His daughter is completing her PhD at the University of Southern California. Uh, a very, very warm and wonderful family uh, with whom you know, it's been my pleasure to become acquainted over these last few years. I would also mention present in the room is uh, another distinguished guest, the site director of the Brigham Young University program in South India, uh, Professor M. V. Krishnaya, who is sitting right here. He comes to us in the spring, typically for once, for about a month, uh, to help us prepare for the program in the fall and the winter. So it's a great pleasure also to welcome uh, Professor Krishnaya to this, to this uh, gathering. I think without any further ado, I will turn the floor now over to Vice Chancellor Aparam and let him speak to some issues that I think should be of interest to all of us, whether or not our discipline is social science or engineering or what have you. Because, as you know, India is one of the most rapidly developing economies in the world today with a growth rate that is set to exceed that of China's within probably a couple of years and then continue longer than any country undergoing an economic expansion in, in, the, his, in the history of, of this world, according to some. India is a force that simply we cannot afford not to reckon with as a collaborator and also a competitor, uh, but mostly as a collaborator. Um, and what we have to learn from them uh, is, is, is very important indeed. So, uh, I'm very happy again to welcome him to our campus, and again, without any further ado, I turn the floor over to our good friend, uh, Vice Chancellor Aparagara. Thank you, Professor Charles Rickles, for his generosity of words in describing me. Charles is a great friend of India and a great lover of my language, Telugu. I am really astonished the warmth, the affection he shows, shows on us through my language, that is Telugu. Thank you, Charles, for the wonderful gesture. I have my wife, Magamuni, my daughter, Sushmita, my son, Tejasri. Half of my family lives in America. My daughter and son, they live here. 
I and my wife live in India, talking about it. As was Charles Michael said, India is doing wonderfully well now, particularly in the area of education. To talk about Indian education, perhaps I need to touch upon a little history. India had a university called the Nalanda University. It was a wonderful university, doing wonderful development from 4th century to 12th century. And all of you know, India is famous for mathematics. Einstein himself has confessed that we, we owe a lot to Indians because they made us to know how to count in his own words, within course. That's only tip of the aspect. In fact, most of us Indians, we are trying to rediscover ourselves. I'm thankful to the Dean of Social Sciences, who has presented me a book on American history, which I was going through. Similarly, new books are written. I think some of you might be knowing famous Indian names. I think some of the, at least the third I could see here, of Indian origin. Seshi Tarur, who was with the United National System for many years. India Irregular, that is the word with which he has written. As I said, we are trying to look at our strengths, what, what, what was our past, how to leverage our strength and past for a brighter future. Well, we have succeeded in our attempts. We always tell that I am proud to be an Indian. And again, we tell that I am proud to be an Indian here because there are 3.22 million Indians in America. 38% of doctors in America are Indians. 12% of scientists in America are Indians. 36% of NASA employees are Indians. 34% of Microsoft employees are Indians. 28% of IBM employees are Indians. 17% of Intel employees are Indians. In fact, Intel has employed many of my former students. 13% of Xerox employees are Indians. This talks about the presence of India in this land of opportunities. We call America is a land of opportunities. And we also tell if America is a land of opportunities, India is a land of ideas. So our ideas are thriving now. And India, again, to glorify that, as I already told you, invented number system. The person responsible to invent number system was Ali Bata. He was a professor in the University of Nalanda. Of course, Nalanda is Dimash now, our Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, a great economist, and then Nabil Ali, Dr. Amartya Singh, together they tried to build Ramana University again in a sparring 10,000 acre campus in a state called Bihar, close to a city called Patna. I invite all of you, if you have time to come and visit, the effort is going into that institution. Of course, Japanese government is, it, is putting its money into that. Unfortunately, they are doing not, not that well now. We have to see what will be going to happen. But Government of India is committed, and they are trying to bring the, the past glory to the future. Well, I leave it here about India and uh, several fields. In fact. Uh, I don't know how many of you play chess here. Chess is the game invented in India. 
and it's a mind game. And coming to surgery, Sushruta was considered to be father of surgery. These are all people who work in the university system, that is what we call Nananda University. In fact, we used to have a good system in India for the positions of vice for the positions of vice chancellors and professors. It's a kind of a challenge. If a person like Charles Meckers is knowledgeable, if he comes up and says that I can challenge after all in his own domain of knowledge. And there will be a kind of rounds of discussions or whatever it is, arguments, whatever it is. If he beats me in all the knowledge, then I have to leave my chair and give it to him. That's how the questions in Alanda are offered, including to that of Vice Chancellor. Highly democratic system. That is also a kind of a system where the Indians recognize the talent of the others. From that system, of course, we have taken some changes. But now we are very, very happy we are doing very well. In Mark Twain, words itself, India is the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of present, and the great grandmother of creation. Our most valuable and most constructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India only. This is what Mark Twain said. Roland Roland, the French scholar said, if there is one place on the face of earth where all the dreams of living men have found a home from the very earliest days when man began the dream of existence, it is India. These are some of the things about India because I wanted to introduce to India since some of you are coming to India under this India Abroad program under the leadership of our friend Charles Michaels. I am asked to talk about globalization and the technology and to say something about Indian contribution to science and technology. I will start with the contribution of Indian scientists in the area of technology. The cell phones which most of you are using now, the idea behind the cell phone, which we call microwave technology, was first invented by Indians. Of course, we could not make a gadget. That's why I say India is a land of ideas. Several of the things started in India. Maybe we do not have the will or motivation to move it forward. We couldn't really do well that well. But now we are doing very well as the statistics which I said just now is an indication. <coughs> One thing all of all the world accepts that Indians are good in information technology. And India has become a kind of workforce provider for information technology. Whatever they want it may be. And uh, our, your heart mail was made popular by India. The mailing system. So that was the contribution. And when we talk together about globalization technology, perhaps we cannot miss information technology, which has done so much to us. World Wide Web, Kim Ben Lee, 1891, 1991. And the present day internet, of course, we have to give way to. American Society for this. Particularly the organizations like DARPA, ARPA, and University of Southern California, where my daughter comes from. Went and kept, of course, a student, started that. Educate, a effort has gone to that. So, worldwide web and internet, they have revolutionized the way we live and the way we think. Watch out, that another change is coming in a big way. In fact, that is being described in a recent book called The Shadows, written by Nicholas G. Carr. 
who says that we would get a new gadget which may be much more powerful in the form of one planetary worldwide computer from www to wwc is the imagination which might take place in the coming decades. With this, the changes would be mind boggling. Well, for most of us, WWW is worldwide math, but we are given a new meaning to that. We say this is world without walls. This is the greatest globalize. The advent of the internet in its shape and form has provided a common platform upon which countries from all parts of the earth are able to communicate and share information. Globalization is often a difficult phenomenon to describe comprehensively. However, one aspect of globalization that tends to be most apparent in almost every aspect of life is the emergence of technology. Particularly the way in which technology is globally integrating the peoples of the world. A number of perspectives are presented regarding the role of technology in globalization. Central to, to this is the notion of adaptable technology. The idea is that the placement of technology in developing, developing countries often causes social costs. Maybe that is of interest to Professor Charles Michaels. As well as costs in the form of harmonization, employment, and employment displacement, and the digital divide. Here, as a technologist myself, though I tend to disagree, I always look at the brighter side of the technology. And when it comes to science and technology, we always look that science is against nature. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. When Rob Henry said, anything heavier than air cannot go up. This is what Rob Henry said. Within 50 years of what he said, Red Brothers proved by flying a plane which is heavier than a into the sky. So always, that's why we say science is against nature. Of course, technology is nothing but applied science. What for are we developing technology? Is it for the comfort of humanity or the better way? This is where there is a debate between the people who are arguing for the negatives. People survived without technology. People lived without a cell phone, without a computer, without a telephone. But the kind of comfort which these gadgets have brought, I would look at them as advancement of civilization, or advancement of comfort of living. We have made some surveys, particularly most people come to America from India. One case study of two households in Northern this. Grandparents of one family whose grandchildren were in America. They could not communicate properly with their grandchildren. Because of that, they could not share their love and affection. And that family could not survive for long. The other case study, where we provided all the <coughs> technological gadgets, where they could share, including pictures of the family. And the grandparents were so happy and so jubilant that they could see the grandchildren. That happiness gave them extra years of age. This is how I could see the impact of technology. But the other side of the technology, of course, people argue 
about losing jobs and things like that. I am going to look at that, that we will come to it later. But there are certain evils. Cell phone being misused, we use it for some other purposes. It always happens. Once a facility is given to a gentleman in a skull room, they will definitely misuse. We cannot help. But again, we are trying to look at what kind of preventive actions can be taken to technology for the betterment of the use of the technology for the welfare. Of course, pharmaceutical technology, this is another big thing which some of the anthropologists are arguing about. That's what they call the apathic of pharmacology, where the introduction of new drugs reveals global disparities of wealth and class, since many individuals cannot afford access. This is an important aspect. I think most of the people are now from the anthropology department. We have to look about it. As far as India is concerned, we are trying to look at several ways of giving better generic medicines for some of the diseases. The apathy of pharmacology is a big aspect or a problem which all of you and all of us should start to think about. I just leave it there, then come back to this aspect later. But now let us look at what globalization has brought. All of you would agree when I say that globalization brought a new international system which has replaced the Cold War. The new system, which is synonymous with globalization, is most appropriately identified as the integration of technology across national states. Integration has been driven in the large part by globalization's defining technologies, namely, Computerization, miniaturization, digitization, satellite communications, fiber optics, and the internet and the like. Coming back to World Wide Web or World Without Walls, we know the tremendous impact it has been making by giving direct power to individuals than to any time, than to anybody, any system, in any time of history. With the advent of World Wide Web and Internet, people are empowered. This is another important aspect which technology has brought. As the world is networked, there will be more direct power to individuals than at any time in history. Overall, the integration technology is the clearest and most precise method of characterizing globalization. Application of technology must adhere to specific standards like that of adaptable technology. This is another important aspect. Technology, no matter where it is applied, can only be understood and valued in relation to the social group that creates or uses it, because every model of society and development conceives of and uses a different kind of technology. Adaptable technology needs to have well defined guidelines, clearly designed uses, and a thorough assessment of its appropriate use. Technology is determined to, and the course of implementation. It neither gives priority to community action nor local necessities. When I say adaptable technology, I remember in my younger days, thanks to Rajiv Gandhi, our handsome Prime Minister, he provided us all computers. 
but somehow our people are not adept at using the technology. In fact, he said, he made a rule that all the bureaucrats in Delhi, they should have a computer on their table. All the secretaries. They had a computer in the room, but they could not use the technology because they are not adept to the technology. And they used that computer to irrigate their rooms. This is a kind of aspect which I mean when I talk about adapting technology. Buying technology is one thing, but adapting it to the society of need is our most important. So technology overall is essential, and information technology is the one which has done so much for the globalization, and as I said, it has reduced the distance between individuals, between nations, between cities, thereby empowering these people directly or making or assuring a new society which we call knowledge society. Coming to digital divide, I do not know whether still a digital divide exists, but we had this uh, digital divide in 90s. As far as my country is concerned, this wonderful guy takes us for he doesn't have any divide. And Professor Charles Michaels himself is a testimony for that. The people whom he meets every day on the shores of Visakhapatnam, whose cell fish they use cell phone. The vegetable vendor uses a cell phone. So what it means is there's no question of not being adept at the technology, but looking at the necessity and the need and grab the opportunity to use the technology to satisfy the need. That is what this information technology did, for that matter, any other technology. And we have been discussing about the Japanese tsunami and the nuclear power this uh, afternoon, I think, in the next time. What do you call this technology? Maybe good and bad. So far, good. So far, they enjoyed. Japan has enjoyed the power, of the nuclear power, the nuclear energy for all their activities. But nature's fury has suddenly made it disastrous. Now we have to have a good it. In India, also, we had a tsunami, and we had one nuclear power station on the shores of Chennai which is named after one of our illustrious Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Reactor, we call IGPAR. Somehow our tsunami did not affect that reactor, we will say. I am not an expert to go into the details of the Japanese tsunami. So, looking at the technologies, is it good or bad? Maybe these experiments, particularly the tsunami experiment of Japan, might give us or tell us or teach us a lesson or two about the location of these reactors. Because looking at this, I am afraid in my own shores of Kakanada, the Reliance Industries is having a large repository of oil. They are building a big storehouse under the sea. I am worried. Of course, they are also worried. They are trying to look at what kind of different technologies we could invest. I do not know what Dr. Michael had in mind when he asked me to talk about globalization technology. In a single sentence, perhaps I can conclude, technology has really brought our nations and individuals together. That is what we call globalization. But I am interested, as he himself said about internationalization of education. India is looking towards making its students 
globalized. We want our students not only to serve in our country. In fact, after as a vice chancellor, the institution which has more than 0.25 million students pursuing education at any point of time, after looking at your humanitarian activities, yesterday you were so kind to take us there. I am trying to make at least one percent of my students to become world leaders. Not necessarily be technological leaders, leaders of humanity. This is one aspect. And that has become possible because I could come and see here. And that's again, might interest my students to come and work volunteers, as volunteers here. And I'm glad Dr. Parkinson, uh, the Dean of uh, Engineering, he was talking about uh, humanity engineering. These are some of the things which we are interested in in globalization. When I say internationalism of education, in India too, but really in ancient India, we had some of these notions. But really when we had kings and queens, well, I don't think we had queens, we had kings. Only England has kings. Our kings used to send their children outside their kingdom. And the premise is, education is not complete unless you leave the shores. The dictum was that. So, we are also experimenting that. We also found that many of our students, when they leave the country, leave the place, they do wonderfully well. In fact, I myself saw more than thousands of students. Their classroom performance while they were students of mine. And after they come back and take a course or two with me, or honors with me, I could see the vast change in their attitude. So, the expansion of the knowledge. That's why in my university, I observe one day in a year as Internationalization Day, where Professor Charles talks to my students and exchange of ideas gives his ideas. This is highly essential. So more or less, digital divide may exist, but its existence can be ignored. <coughs> now, what about the Urban rural divide. Of course, you are fortunate. While we were driving from Salt Lake City to Provo, Dr. Charles showed me the spread of the city. In certain pockets, in my state, the cities are spread like that. But there are certain areas where we could see really the urban rural divide. In such situations, how to look at the technological aggravation where the implementation of technology requires limited labor power and fuels the migration of rural populations to big cities. This is a big challenge for us. This is again which we are trying to address. Our own agglomerations are becoming larger. And the urban infrastructure is not able to cope with the expansion of this agriculture. And the founder of our nation, father of the nation, we call him Mahatma Gandhi. He used to advocate, he has a theory of man versus machine. He identifies the occidental oriental thinking, which is soulful. That's what he calls man. And your initial revolution and technological advancement and development, he identifies that as machine. Well, here again, I have my own ideas about it. Had Gandhi been alive today, 
He might have noticed that some of the machines which have souls. In fact, that's where information technology comes into picture. I don't know how many of your computer graphs here. Computer software, we call it the truth software. It will find out by observing you for a part for some time whether you are a habitual layer or not. So that, that kind of aspect has come into technology. That's what I want to stress upon. You understand better. Satya, Satya, research, now we call it in Sanskrit. To differentiate between truth and untruth. If you are able to differentiate between truth and untruth, we are a super human being, that's what we say. And my computer, which is able to differentiate between truth and untruth, has become a super human being. So, this is where I want to relate, uh, dispel some of the misgivings or thoughts of option to thinking when they say too much of industrialization is inhuman. Having said that, we need to really address issues of this uh, rural populations where they do not have enough skills to migrate, to handle technology or to use technology. Uh, become gainfully employed using technology. One good example <coughs> which I think is, uh, it shows the way India is doing. I think some of you know in Hyderabad we have recently built a good airport. An airport built almost 60 miles away from the city. Before the airport was built, we could see the urban rural divide. The populace are mostly coming from tribal areas. And we could, this man who has built this airport called GMR, who has become 17th richest man in our country, he has taken the task of uh, corporate social responsibility and he has picked up the rural populace, trained them in technology. Maybe not a high skill, but a skill needed to build an airport. 30% of the workforce are gone from day one because you cannot have more numbers. With these attitudes, we are making the technology Adopt to technology. This is another aspect which I want to touch upon. Well, we all know technology clearly results in the acceleration of productivity and growth. Of course, this is through industrial processes because industrial processes are revolutionized more so by the recent forms of technology such as nanotechnology biotechnology, of course, I come, at, come again about biomimics, but network technology and information technology. This being the case, now, recently I was in England, I think, I told you, in the survey, where one of my friends from Central Florida University has come into the workshop. Technology is available, looking at the comfort, and we have so much we are very fortunate to read the rights and all. How long can you do that? Why can't you go back to nature? This workshop is basically dharma regulatory analogies between skin, plant, and termites. If you look at your skin, there is so much of regulatory mechanism. If you look at some of the dwellings built by, you know about ant hills, right? If you look at ant hill, whatever be the outside temperature, the inside temperature of the ant hill is constant. And 
there are trees which are as high as 200 meters and the photosynthesis is so strong a leaf at the top of the tree which is 200 meters away from the ground is able to draw water so looking at these principles of technology, whatever we might call it, can we look at future? Can we become closer to the nature and all of such technologies? That is another big challenge is can be a problem because of advancement of knowledge. Not to deviate from today's topic, globalization of technology. Technology is making us to come together. Globalization, in fact, the word global village. Everywhere, we do not have such words. We never call our death or the planet as a global village. Now we are calling it. We are able to call it because of the integration of the nations, peoples, their thinking, knowledge. So, globalization technology or inseparable. We cannot talk about globalization without technology. So the proper globalization, technology is important. Technology is the one which integrates all of us. Uh, should I stop here? Some more time? But coming to pharmacology, a path is of uh, pharmacology or pharmacy. That's what because I have younger minds here to, be, to think about it. Here I am also learning. A drug is not like a cell phone. Cell phones are becoming cheaper and cheaper because there are better markets. In fact, India and China have become better markets for cell phones. Not so for the pharmaceutical industry. New drugs and new MQs, they are following class distinctions. Here again, actually I wanted, I requested to Charles, this is where I wanted to talk about my research. Uh, where I am trying to bring uh, these new drugs to masses without any class distinction. To make it, we have a new area of knowledge called bioinformatics which is close to biotechnology and which is close to biochemics. But keeping it aside, what we need to do now? Many people around the world have curable diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. They die because drugs to these diseases are non resistant are no longer affected. Here, nations like America have to come forward. This is what we call <coughs> environmental issues. Global warming, someone was uh, talking about it. I think your friend who left uh, met him in the week. That aside, this malaria and tuberculosis might affect the whole globe. It may be in existence in poorer countries, but unless all of us come together to conquer this through a new technology, perhaps all of us will suffer, like we are suffering in the global warming. There is one caution, that's where we need to look at how to make our place a better place to live by working together. That's why I said cooperation, collaboration is very, very important when it comes to the knowledge societies. And perhaps later stays is compete among ourselves for supremacy of the knowledge. When competing ourselves for supremacy of knowledge, there's also compete for the human being work. That's very, very important. So technology brings good things to life but how much good? Is it full or part? Time is up.
set out. You can raise your finger if you want to stop. So, this stop. Uh, I will just conclude the couple minutes. In fact, I, well, I think at least 80s or so, I read a good article. And the, the paper I forgot. There's no harm if Chinese start drink, drinking Coca Cola. But where do they throw the Coca Cola bottles? That's, uh, that's how it has appeared. In the sense, I'm talking about waste management. If you look at waste and the what we are contributing to the pollution, Plastics. And I and my wife are really surprised. In my campus, I banned plastic, pieces of plastic. I, normally, our students use only gunny bags, whatever it is made. And here, still, we are using plastic. This is another big thing. Now, we are finding out ways and means of not only reducing using plastics, but to manage waste. Waste management technology. So technology which has brought us together, which is uh, helping us to think together, to collaborate, to cooperate. Yeah. So we have to look for new technology where, by managing the waste so well, we can give a greener planet to, this, to us, to our population, to our generations. We are comfortable now, but let us not make this planet uncomfortable to our children, grandchildren. So here, again, a new technology. In fact, I put it that the other way around. This is where most advanced societies like yours need to adapt to the technology. Waste management is one which you need to concentrate. You have good drainage systems, etc., but there is not sufficient. If you, in fact, one day I saw a picture showing the oil spill on the shores. And also, plenty of blood, uh, huge fish which were killed on the shores of Denmark and so forth. All that is contributing to the pollution, which again comes back. If a single individual suffers as in India or in Africa, I feel your heart should beat. And we need to work for that kind of technology. That's where the Gam Yang University and Jawaharlal Nehru Technology University should come together and come to the business as well. Thank you very much for your wonderful <laughs>